title of my talk is Mind the Gap, Why Inequality Affects Us All. And one of the most striking things that's happened in New Zealand in the last three decades is the rapid increase in the gap between the rich and the poor. When I arrived here last uh, January, last year, from the UK, which is still pretty divided in terms of an upper class, wealthy old families who own most of the land, um, I expected to find New Zealand much less divided. New Zealanders had, after all, prided themselves, yourselves, on being much more egalitarian than the kind of UK cousins that you left behind. Well, if that was the case till the 1980s, all that changed in the 1980s and the 1990s. In fact, if you look at the um, figures for the period 1982 to 1998, what happened basically was that the disposable income for the top decile, the top 10% of the population, rose by 36%. And the uh, equivalent disposable income for the lowest income group decreased by 17%. And that kind of widening between the wealthiest and the most poor has uh, increased every year since, with the exception of one year, which was 2007. To the extent that most surveys now, and for every survey in the last year, certainly, that's come out looking at inequality among different countries, has concluded that New Zealand is the sixth most unequal country in the world. That includes um, Helen Clark's UNDP report in October, uh, one or two more... Uh, indigenous reports in New Zealand and um, the book that came out last year called The Spirit Level which took, um, looked at 23 wealthy, wealthy countries, developed countries and looked at the ratio between the combined wealth of the top 20% of the population and the bottom 20% of the population and then ranked countries in order and uh, they came to exactly the same conclusion. The, the worst country in terms of, if you want to use that pejorative term, in terms of a uh, gap between rich and poor is Singapore, the top 20% 10 times richer than the bottom 10%. The second is, not surprisingly, the USA, but um, there's a group of countries, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, Israel, Portugal, that are all clustered around in sort of sixth position. And the gap here is now seven times um, different. Well, you might say, so what? Doesn't this just show that we've got an economy that... Um, allows those who work hard, who take risks, who use their entrepreneurial skills, who create the wealth to reap the just rewards. Doesn't it show we've got an economy that provides real incentives, particularly for young people, to achieve, to go for goals, to reach the top and get ahead of their peers? After all, we're not all the same. We all have different gifts. Uh, we've all got different drive. So why shouldn't those who put more in get more out? And why shouldn't the market reflect that? Who, in fact, but the most innately jealous or the most rabid socialist ought to worry about the fact that there's a gap between the rich and the poor. Well, all that may be as it is, but it turns out there's actually quite a downside to growing inequality. Some research that was published last year, fairly painstaking research that's uh, been conducted over the last 30 years, suggests an extremely strong correlation, if not a causal link, between the extent of inequality in a society and that society's performance across a whole range of social indices. This research was published in this book called The Spirit Level by two UK academics. And they looked at the 23 richest countries in the world. And they found, and they also looked actually individually at the 50 US states as well. And uh, they found pretty much the same pattern emerging, where you've got um, greater inequality, you've got uh, a larger percentage of the population will be imprisoned, um, there will be lower literacy rates, there will be more obesity, particularly among children, more teenage pregnancies, worse mental health, shorter average lifespans. There's a whole range of issues. This is just a small selection. I don't want to depress you too much. But um, these are the kind of areas that they looked at. And the greater the inequality, the worse the performance on this range of indices. And what this shows, of course, is that inequality affects us all. It's not just the very poor, those at the bottom of society. But, it, I mean, to maintain uh, a larger percentage of people in prison it costs us out of our taxes. Uh, where there's greater obesity and poor health among people, that costs us out of our taxes in terms of uh, health care and things. So it's not as though it's just the, the people at the very bottom of society who suffer in an unequal society. We're all affected.
So what conclusions do we draw from this? Well, the most ridiculous conclusion that we can draw is that if we just did away with inequality tomorrow, all our problems will be solved. We wouldn't have to worry about double bunking. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry about children getting diabetes, and we would all actually live a longer and much healthier lifestyle. Well, clearly, in cutting inequality is not a panacea for all our ills. But the evidence does show that where is even small decreases in inequality in various countries, um, that can make a difference to the quality of people's lives. And I say not just those at the bottom of society, it's not just that the poorer get a bit better off, there are fewer poorer people, but actually everybody is better off. There's no one way to achieve this. When you look at the different countries who've actually achieved a reduction in inequality, countries like Japan, countries like the Scandinavian countries, you see a range of different ways. In some cases it might be um, improving or targeting welfare, in other ways, it might be restructuring the tax system. In other ways, it might, in other countries, it might be um, introducing employee ownership schemes within companies. There's no one way. In Japan, of course, gross salaries cluster around uh, a mean, and so uh, taxation is not so severe, and there's a low welfare state. In Sweden, for example, uh, taxation is much more aggressive, and much more money is spent on the welfare state. In New Zealand, we would need to work out what the most politically acceptable way is to cut down on inequality. So the main point I'm making is that the evidence, I think, is compelling, and it's evidence that we need to take seriously. Inequality affects us all and lowers the quality of our society. Lowering, lowering inequality would benefit us all. And in fact, I think what this proves is that the quality of our social relations, the nature of our society, is related to the material foundations of our society. In the old days, this kind of debate would be framed in the language of redistribution of wealth. We'd be talking about more, uh, a bigger state. We'd be talking about the old kind of command economies that we saw in the Soviet bloc before the end of the Cold War. And people would say, oh, this is just the politics of envy. Well, it's certainly not the politics of envy. I mean, if you know that I'm a professor, then you've worked out that I'm in the top 5% of the wage earning bracket. And I'm actually talking about this. If I thought that tax was going to be used really effectively, I would be very happy to pay more tax. Um, I was actually quite upset with the tax cuts last April. Better off, and people at the poorer end of society are actually worse off. Some of them even lost their benefits. I don't think that's the way to run a tax system. I want my tax to be used for the common good. I'm actually with those 44 German billionaires you may have read about last year who wrote to the president of Germany actually impelling her that they wanted to pay more tax. They actually said, we need to pay more tax for the benefit of the country to, so it can be spent on social and economic welfare programs. Well, I'm right behind them, and I think that's exactly the right approach. And they actually said, we don't want more of the same. We want you to use this money uh, in the interests of social justice. So it's not about the politics of envy, and I don't think it's about politics either. It's certainly not about partisan politics, because what we're talking about here is changes that would be for the benefit of everybody right across society. We are all poorer when there is greater inequality. And if we reduce inequality, it's not just that there are fewer poor people, we're actually all better off. And society, and this is one thing you notice in societies where there is less inequality, they're more trusting, they're more cohesive, they're more at ease with themselves. It's certainly in all our interest. In a sense, just to conclude, some of this research is telling us what we thought we knew anyway. Coming as I do from a theological perspective, I could point you to any number of texts in the Hebrew scriptures or in the Christian scriptures which describe economic systems that operate for the common good, that actually um, operate on the recognition that we're all intrinsically of the same worth and none of us should drop off the edge, or economic models that operate in the interests um, of the common good where um, there's actually a gap, uh, the gap between rich and poor is restricted. There are mechanisms that restrict the gap widening between rich and poor because they fear the consequences of that happening. And now it so happens that this research in the area of public health is proving exactly what we thought we knew. One of the themes this evening is that there is more to life than simply getting richer. In fact, I would say the richer some of us get, the poorer we all become. Thank you very much. <laughs>